Hello, guys. Nice to see you. How are you doing? Hello. Uh, we're fine. Thanks. And you? Good. Yeah, also well. Thanks. <clears throat> so let's wait a couple of minutes so more people can join us. Hi. Nice to see you. So how was your fall break? Did you manage to relax a bit or still a lot of work? Kind of. Mm -hmm. Always work. That's how it should be <clears throat> for students and PhD students. But it doesn't get better in future. Get more and more work, so. Hello, how are you? Good, thanks. How are you? Good. Okay, nice to see you. So we should have how many people usually join these lectures? Hello. Hi, nice to see you. I think usually about 30 plus. Uh, I attended okay. not, not, all, not all the courses, but uh, I have seen uh, 30 or 40 people. Mm -hmm. Okay. It depends. <laughs> then let's wait a bit longer. <clears throat> so today we are going to discuss uh, my field of my research, which is organic electronics and opto electronics, like photovoltaics, so in particular organic semiconductors. Uh, so it's new at physics department at NU. Uh, I joined the physics department as assistant professor um, last year, so it's already second year at my of my research and teaching at Nazarbayev University. And uh, I'm in active process of establishing my um, labs. So one lab, uh, device characterization lab is almost uh, ready. Uh, we already equipped it with most important uh, equipment. Uh, so I believe within one month, we should be able to start doing uh, measurements. However, there is also need uh, in making devices. And uh, that is another lab, which is like device fabrication lab. There it will be some um, required some efforts to organize things still. Uh, but uh, since uh, I, uh, successfully applied for the CRP, Collaborative Research Project. Um, hopefully everything will be okay and uh, uh, this project will start um, early next year, like uh, early January next year. So by January next year, I hope everything should be already organized. I mean, both uh, device fabrication and device characterization labs. So it will be possible to start actively working on uh, the project, which uh, involves active device fabrication and device characterization under different conditions. And uh, uh, today I will talk, like introduce this field of organic semiconductors and organic optoelectronic devices. <clears throat> and during our next meeting, which will be on uh, Thursday, will be a bit uh, tight schedule because uh, there's a planned uh, visit of Institute of uh, Nuclear Physics in Almaty. Uh, I got to know it only about it only um, last week. So we, in the last moment, tried to organize all these things. And I have to go there because uh, this institute is 
the major pro, uh, partner of our collaborative project, uh, which starts next, um, like this uh, early January 2020, uh, 2022. Uh, so I will try to manage to fly uh, to Almaty and uh, deliver this lecture from there. Uh, hopefully everything works and uh, on Thursday at 4.30 uh, p.m. Uh, we will be able to organize the second lecture, uh, which will be focused more, like also will include some of my previous results, but with uh, definitely more focus on my future um, projects, which are going to be realized uh, at Nazarbayev University. And one of them is this CRP uh, project. Uh, another is faculty development grant, which I also have already applied, however, haven't yet heard the results. Uh, so we're still waiting. <clears throat> That's why it's a bit some level of uncertainty about that project, but I believe that it has good chances to be uh, funded also. So that is general description of our um, work together during these two lectures. Uh, you are welcome to interrupt me during my presentation uh, when you have any questions. So don't wait until I finish because uh, you may forget some questions. You also uh, may, um, there will be a chance that there's not uh, enough time left. Uh, so better interrupt me in the process of presentation so we can uh, immediately uh, make things clear. So you can follow the presentation and um, understand what I'm talking about. Good, I believe that it's already <clears throat> time to start. So far we have 16 people. Um, I hope that they will join us on the way because as I understand that's kind of mandatory to visit for students who attend the class. Um, but uh, in any way, it, will, it is recorded. Yeah, it's automatically recorded. So um, all these lectures will be available uh, online if you request uh, this recorded version. I will uh, provide you access to it. Okay, so let me start to share my screen. Let's see how it works. Okay, guys, do you see my screen now? Yes. yes, yes, yes. Okay, that's good. So before we start, any questions, organizational moments, or anything would you like to discuss? Yeah, if not, then you will have chances to ask me questions during the uh, talk. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, today I'm going to present you um, some of my previous results and my field of introduced my field of research, which is uh, focused on next generation organic photovoltaics and optoelectronics. Uh, <clears throat> the structure, um, some outline of uh, our today's uh, lecture, my presentation, uh, will be first short uh, overview of my background and expertise. Uh, very uh, short statements on a bunch of different projects I was um, actively working during recent years. And then we will focus on two like major uh, topics. First is generation recombination processes in organic solar cells and also um, near IR um, uh, organic photodiodes. So you can use them um, these organic semiconductors in field of optoelectronics as uh, solar cells which generate electricity or um, photodiodes which um, are used to detect weak signals um, and can be introduced in different uh, optoelectronic circuits. And then we will sum summarize it with short uh, summary. So, uh, before joining the uh, uh, physics department of Nazarbayev University, I spent about two and a half years uh, at Hemoy Center in Berlin uh, on materials and energy um, as a 
in the scope of Green Talents uh, program and also as a postdoctoral fellow of Alexander von Humboldt uh, Foundation. Uh, so there I was uh, mainly working on um, uh, graphene-based nanocomposites, some hybrid nanocomposites of uh, graphene with uh, so-called conjugated polyelectrolytes, means we have some uh, polymers, conductive polymers, conjugated polymers, um, but they were synthesized in that way that they had additional ionic functionalities on these uh, backbones of the polymers. So they serve as electrolytes also. So that's why they call poly, uh, elect, uh, <coughs> conjugated polyelectrolytes. So we found some interesting uh, unique features of such uh, heterobilayer nanocomposites in terms of temperature switchable type of conductivity. So there is some doping effect of organic layer on graphene and that is um, modulated with uh, temperature. Also, I focused uh, on uh, photodegradation of hybrid perovskites. It's quite hot topic um, in photovoltaics uh, research now, uh, this uh, hybrid perovskite materials. Um, the um, uh, problem is instability, and uh, we were trying to understand the microscopic processes and nature of these uh, photo instability issues. Uh, so uh, another project related to perovskite solar cells was uh, radiation hardness of perovskite solar cells. Surprisingly, um, despite of uh, photo instability, uh, perovskite solar cells exhibit uh, quite a high tolerance to um, ionize, uh, ionizing uh, radiation. And uh, uh, these uh, like orders of magnitude uh, more stable against high energy protons than uh, for instance, conventional silicon solar cells uh, and photodiodes. So that is quite um, unexpected and remar remarkable uh, feature of perovskite uh, materials, hybrid perovskite materials. We were trying to, um, first we were uh, the first group to reveal such uh, features and uh, publish them. Um, and also we were trying later to understand uh, how these um, radiation uh, stability is realized in a hybrid perovskites. So I will focus on this uh, particular question um, a bit uh, later during our next uh, lecture, because this has direct relationship with the CRP project, which I'm going to realize uh, at uh, um, Nazarbayev University involving not only perovskites, but also organic solar cells and optoelectronic devices. Uh, also, there was one interesting uh, project, was more like a project for fun, it's a side project, uh, thermoelectric devices, pencil and brush drawn on paper. Uh, so we managed to make such um, working thermoelectric uh, devices uh, on paper. And uh, uh, surprisingly, this paper actually got two awards from American Chemical Society, where it was published in ACS Applied Materials Interfaces. So it was quite uh, positively accepted by scientific community, but initially, as I said, it was mostly some project for, for fun. Uh, so also, uh, right before the uh, I got the position of assistant professor at NU, I spent three and a half years at University of California, Santa Barbara, Center for Polymers and Organic Solids, uh, was uh, established uh, by um, Nobel laureate uh, Alan Heger, who got Nobel Prize in Chemistry, uh, actually for inventing the um, and establishing the field of uh, organic semiconductors and electronics. Uh, <clears throat> so that's why it's kind of, uh, traditional um, school there uh, in field of organic electronics and photovoltaics, which is still um, active nowadays. Uh, so there I was working specifically on organic semiconductors. Uh, and uh, here are listed a bunch of projects. Um, so we were working on uh, doping of organic semiconductors with Lewis acids uh, is kind of new type of doping because usually 
people use molecular doping of organic semiconductors. And uh, uh, here was approach with Lewis acids. And uh, the main goal was to explain the mechanism uh, of doping. Uh, also, that is what we are going to talk mostly uh, today, generation recombination processes in organic solar cells. So we need to understand how we um, generate free charge carriers uh, in um, organic solar cells in the active layer of organic solar cells, how they are recombined there, how they can be extracted and contribute uh, to a useful electric current in the external circuit. Uh, also, I'm sorry. yes, um, it's a bit, uh, I, don't, I don't know how our orga organic uh, molecules, organic structures are capable of generating, I mean, uh, this free, <laughs> free carriers. I mean, if you think about yeah, sure. some. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say that in details, we will discuss it a bit later when I give an introduction of this organic uh, semiconductor. So we definitely will highlight this question. But uh, um, shortly, I would uh, answer your question now as um, it is actually not. So we can tune the band gap, the distance between this HOMO and LUMO energy levels. HOMO stands for highest occupied molecular levels, and LUMO stands for lowest unoccupied molecular levels. If we combine this, uh, like compare this to classical <clears throat> inorganic crystalline semiconductors, so that could be a balance and conduction band. Uh, so the gap, we can change this gap um, based on the chemical structure of our molecules. And there are unlimited possibilities to change this chemical structure. So we can get pretty much in a wide range of values, pretty much any band gap we want. Uh, by choosing different molecules. And this band gap will define um, which photon energy is required to uh, excite electrons from HOMO levels to LUMO levels. However, the problem is that the electric constant of organic semiconductors is very low. It's like something about three. And electrostatic interaction between photo excited electron and hole uh, is quite strong. So instead of creating free charge carriers, which can participate in charge transfer and be collected by electrodes, um, we create excitons, so bounded um, electron hole pair. And that's why we need a mixture of two materials, donor and acceptor, in order to um, split these excitons at the interface between donor and acceptor and then form free and electron, um, well, uh, uh, electrons and holes, which can be collected uh, at uh, external electrodes. Uh, so uh, I will focus on this in more details because this is very important to understand how organic solar cells work. But thank you for your question. So um, also I was uh, working uh, as we will discuss during this uh, presentation on um, near IR, near infrared organic photodiodes, uh, which are capable of uh, being applied in different fields, including some uh, medical sensors for monitoring uh, pulse. Uh, and uh, uh, they exhibit quite promising uh, characteristics comparable to silicon uh, devices. Uh, one of the, the also interesting projects uh, based, so we were working on so-called organic, uh, ionic organic electronic ratchets. These are uh, organic field effect transistors uh, with attached antenna or just a AC uh, signal, some function generator, and they can convert some uh, AC um, signal or radio frequency signal uh, into a DC current. So it's kind of a um, low power uh, supply uh, system, which can convert a radio frequency signal from environment, which is also uh, always um, available, some uh, electromagnetic noise uh, into some useful small current, which can power uh, miniature remote um, electronic uh, devices or internet of things and stuff like that. 
<clears throat> so let us focus a bit on organic, like introduction of organic semiconductors. So if we are talking about plastic, which this material actually is, so we have some associations with uh, packaging, with isolation. We know that all these wires, copper wires are covered with uh, plastic isolation. So we know that plastic does not um, conduct electricity. And that is kind of counterintuitive that we make any electronic devices based on plastic materials. Um, that is true for many uh, type of plastics. However, in um, about 70s uh, were first uh, results published on uh, such a polymer as polyacetylene. And uh, there is some feature, so-called alternating um, double bond between carbon atoms. And uh, these uh, structures with such type of uh, uh, chemical uh, bonds uh, are called conjugated polymers. So the conjugation of, of polymers uh, allows to delocalize electrons all over the um, backbone of this polymer. So uh, electrons can move along the chain of this polymer. And when they are packed in some thin film, um, because of hoping charge transport, they can uh, kind of, in first approximation, jump from one polymer to another, uh, overcoming some potential barriers. Uh, that's why we have some obviously temperature dependent mobility of this hopping charge transport. Uh, but that is the key to um, realization of electrical conductivity in polymer materials. For this work, mm -hmm. yeah, sure. I'm sorry, I'm sorry for interrupting again. So does it mm -hmm. mean that those double bonds turn into single bonds and single bonds turn into double bonds? Uh, no, it's just that uh, we uh, have some weak bond, uh, weaker bond here when we have double bond, and that could at some level, minimum level of thermal activation, allow electron to just move from along the, the uh, delocalized along the uh, chain of the polymer. And uh, um, since we have already um, mobile electric charge, if we realize dense enough packing of these uh, polymer chains uh, in a solid uh, film, uh, they can uh, hop between different polymer chains and uh, eventually move along the um, such bulk. Yeah. Uh, bulk, yeah. And uh, the thing is that uh, obviously mobilities will not be very high. It's not conduction. Uh, band uh, conductivity when we have fully delocalized uh, charge carriers and they uh, can easily move within the bulk of the crystal. Uh, however, uh, that is enough taking into account device configuration of organic electronic and optoelectronic devices when we have very thin active layers. That is enough to uh, operate quite, with quite high uh, parameters. So three authors of these uh, papers, including this guy, Alan Heger, who I mentioned, um, they got Nobel Prize in chem Chemistry in 2000 for um, uh, discovery, as stated in this Nobel Prize uh, committee, uh, for discovery and development of conductive polymers. Uh, <clears throat> so obviously, with uh, realizing that uh, polymers can conduct. Moreover, that polymers can be doped. We will shortly uh, maybe mention about this. Um, so we can increase conductivity by adding some uh, impurities to these um, materials. Uh, there are possibilities for practical applications of this new type of semiconductors. So uh, as you already know, this uh, OLED and OFETs uh, technology, um, organic light emitting diodes, uh, has already found wide application, like industrial application. There are many uh, high quality uh, monitors and TVs um, and large area uh, screens 
uh, which are flexible and uh, because of this inherent property, mechanical property of uh, polymer um, uh, semiconductors, they uh, can be um, uh, implemented in these flexible screens and found wide industrial application. Um, also, another possibility is organic photovoltaic solar cells. They also can be uh, rigid or flexible, depends on the substrates they are made on, of. And uh, uh, this field is quite new. Uh, it's emerging uh, field of um, organic photovoltaics uh, and requires some, um, some time to be established. And in particular, it is necessary to understand better device physics and uh, photoelectronic processes which are going on in such uh, complex systems. Uh, so that's why we are focusing on um, this first part of uh, about organic solar cells of my presentation, in particular generation recombination processes. Uh, so we know that based on many issues with our environment and pollution of, of uh, our atmosphere, uh, global warming, and uh, uh, other related processes of climate change. Uh, it is necessary to find some new sources of, of energy and solar energy is one of the key players uh, along with others, but one of the most important a renewable energy source, uh, which uh, actively is implemented. Uh, so definitely there are a lot of um, industrial scale interest in this field. So there are different types of solar cells, but in this particular, in the scope of our discussion, I would like to divide them uh, on organic, uh, like inorganic, organic and hybrid, organic, inorganic. So uh, these hybrid are perovskite solar cells because they consist of two uh, um, frames, one organic and one uh, inorganic. Uh, so there are some advantages and disadvantages of all these types of solar cells. And uh, uh, if we particularly focus our attention on um, organic solar cells, we can see, first of all, it's possible to uh, achieve low cost because of some uh, solvent uh, solution processing conditions when we spin coat or like print that when we are talking about some large scale production that's printing. Um, uh, also, they possess flip inherent flexibility, um, which allows to make some additional functional, provide additional functionalities of the solar cells um, however, uh, there are uh, still some issues with uh, performance and uh, moderate stability issues. They, their stability is not so bad as stability of hybrid perovskites, which is really the main issue. Um, however, definitely they are lagging behind the stability of uh, silicon solar cells, and uh, uh, there definitely should be some efforts to address these issues. So uh, here you can see some schematic representation of uh, um, some general structure of an um, inverted um, organic solar cell when we have some glass substrate, uh, ITO, indium tin oxide, it's transparent conductive layer, um, some uh, electron transport layer, which is here, zinc oxide layer, it's also spin it's spin coated already on um, ITO, which is uh, magneton spotted on glass substrate. Uh, then we have spin coated um, so called bulk heterojunction layer, which is a um, mixture of donor and acceptor um, organic semiconductors. We will discuss this in more details on the next slide. And also some whole transport layer and uh, um, back electrode. Uh, which uh, are necessary to uh, collect holes. Yes. So electrons are collected by zinc oxide and ITO. Uh, yes, no question. So you basically, this BHG layer you docked with the simultaneously 
acceptor and the donor? Oh, it's it's not doped. It actually consists of acceptor and donor. It's two materials which we mix together. Uh, usually fifty by fifty, uh, like one to one uh, ratio. But there are some deviations. But we it just consists of two uh, different semiconductors, and the difference between them is the energy level of homo and lumo. Uh, I will discuss this in details on the next slide. Uh, here we have um, some energy diagram after, uh, like uh, when we have um, intrinsic active layer, intrinsic means not dope. We actually don't dope these layers. So it could be unintentionally dope, but uh, intentionally we don't dope them. So they ideally should be intrinsic. That's why we have linear distribution of. Um, potential uh, in the uh, active layer means that we have uniform electric field. Uh, and then we have anode and cathode. So these guys have different work functions. And when we put all things together, we get the same Fermi level because they are in equilibrium. And because of the difference in uh, initial difference in work functions between anode and cathode, uh, we get some um, band bending in the active layer. So this uh, and so-called in built-in uh, electric uh, field or built-in voltage. So that built-in electric field um, is a main driving force uh, why um, photogenerated electrons and holes are collected at different electrodes. So holes are collected at the anode and electrons are connected in the cathode electrode. Um, so they need to, to drift inside the active layer in order to be collected by respective electrodes. So um, here is the classical uh, electrical equivalent circuit of a solar cell. So where we have some photocurrent generator, uh, we have some diode because uh, if we check current voltage characteristic of a solar cell in the dark, this black line. Uh, it will possess some uh, asymmetrical conductivity at different polarities. So at reverse bias, you see that current is very small, but at forward bias, at some relatively large forward bias, uh, exponentially current increases. So we will have polarity dependent conductivity which can be um, uh, modeled with a uh, diode characteristic. Also, we have some shunt resistance, which stands for uh, some leakage. We may not have ideal active layers. There could be some pinholes, like microscopic pinholes. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, creates some possible uh, conductive channels, which results in um, leakage loss of our current, so it's not collected by uh, electrodes, but just uh, shorts inside the active layer. Uh, and also there is some serious resistance, uh, which uh, uh, ideally should be equal to uh, zero. So ideally shunt resistance should be equal to infinity. Uh, serious resistance should be equal to zero. Um, unfortunately, that is not uh, possible. And we just need to make our devices in uh, such a way that these uh, guys are as close to ideal values as uh, we can realize technically. Uh, another, uh, so there are three uh, main photoelectric parameters. So here, if we look at the uh, current voltage characteristic of uh, solar cell, it's not only specifically about organic solar cell, any solar cell will uh, have similar uh, light current voltage characteristic. So we have so-called short circuit current when bias is equal to zero, uh, it's like some maximum current we can generate uh, with a solar cell when external load is equal to zero. So we just short circuit anode and cathode. Uh, also, we have some open circuit voltage, means that current is equal to zero. So it's maximum voltage which can be um, measured between cathode and anode electrodes when there is no current flowing through the solar cell. And uh, that is defined by the band gap 
of um, donor and acceptor materials, which we use in our active layer, as well as um, the work functions of anode and cathode. So there are different factors. Also, it depends on recombination, generation recombination processes, because um, open circuit voltage is measured as like is defined from physical point of view as the gap between quasi Fermi levels for electrons and holes in active layer. And uh, uh, those guys will, the position of these quasi Fermi levels will depend on concentration of charge photo generated non equilibrium um, charge carriers in the active layer. Um, that means uh, the more photo generated charge carriers we will generate and, and steady state conditions, the higher their concentration will be, uh, the larger VOC will be, which cannot be larger than the band gap because that will be the limit, a maximum possible value. However, besides generation, we also have recombination processes and uh, uh, we will get some, some balance, steady state balance between generation and recombination, and that will result in um, concentration of uh, photogenerated charge carriers under open circuit conditions. So as um, you see here, if we define um, power conversion efficiency, which is like efficiency performance of solar cell, which is most commercially interesting uh, parameter of uh, a solar cell, uh, we see that this short circuit current and open circuit voltage, they are in the numerator. So we want both them to be as large as possible. And there is in numerator one more coefficient fuel factor. So field factor is defined as the ratio between the maximum output power for this JV characteristic, the maximum output power can be defined when we plot a uh, product of current and voltage within this range uh, as a function of voltage. So then we get some maximum uh, and that is maximum power uh, point. Uh, so the product of this maximum current and maximum um, voltage uh, divided by short circuit product of short circuit current and VOC uh, gives us the uh, field factor. So ideally, this field factor should be unity. So we want uh, it to be like square GV characteristic. So we can uh, extract the most out from the solar cell. However, obviously, it's not possible. It's always smaller than unity. And for um, good devices, it can reach uh, something like 0.8, like 80%. Uh, but it can be much lower also, depends on, on your devices. So we have three parameters for main photoelectric parameters in the uh, numerator of this equation. And they will, uh, so we want simultaneously increase all of them in order to gain higher performance of our solar cells. In the denominator is just the uh, optical power of incident uh, sunlight on our solar cell. Okay, so uh, something, some general information about uh, organic solar cells. Um, first organic solar cells in early 2000 were reported like with decent performance, um, but uh, it was quite low. And since then it was increasing. Uh, over time and reached some kind of saturation in 2015. Uh, there was something like about 11%. And at that time, many uh, researchers believed that uh, it is some limit for which we can achieve for organic solar cells. Um, and the main reason why that was because we were using uh, so-called PCBM, it's fullerene-based um, acceptor material. Uh, there were a few non um, acceptor, uh, non fuller and acceptors. Uh, however, they were low performing, and this PCBM, uh, which is fuller and with some attached uh, functionality, which provides uh, solubility of this material uh, without this attachment, pure fuller and is not soluble. Uh, it was the best acceptor material for high, at that time, high performance um, organic solar cells. However, in 2015, 16, there was 
made a major contribution in development of high performance non um, fuller and acceptors. And you see that now we are not limited by this fuller and structure. We can make any structures we want. Um, there are many options to change uh, these molecules. For instance, we can change heteroatoms, we can change these uh, side chains, uh, we can change the band backbone of the small molecule. Uh, also, we can change these uh, side atoms. Uh, so there are really many options to uh, optimize non fullerene acceptor um, to gain higher performance. And actually, yeah, this is the old slide. So um, now recently, so it was in 2020, um, but uh, recently uh, published work in advanced materials uh, from one of Chinese groups. Uh, usually they are uh, leading uh, the field in world record performance organic solar cells nowadays. Uh, the highest reported and certified uh, performance is 19%. So it really steep increase in performances in just a few recent years um, because of um, wide introduction and uh, um, progress in development of high performance non uh, fuller and acceptors. <clears throat> so now let us focus more on understanding how organic solar cells work. That is a bit different from um, silicon solar cells, and we need to highlight these moments. And that's also to address uh, your previous question, uh, how we can generate charge carriers uh, in organic uh, semiconductors. So as I said before, we create uh, some exciton when we shine light with the energy larger than the band gaps and the distance between HOMO and LUMO, uh, we create exciton. Uh, and because of strong um, electrostatic interaction between hole and electron, uh, we cannot split them efficiently uh, because uh, um, uh, of low dielectric constant. So what we need, we need a bulk heterojunction, means we need a mixture of two organic semiconductors, so-called donor and acceptor. So why donor? Because donor provides electron uh, and acceptor accepts electron. So why it happens? It happens at the interface because we have this um, band gap, like, like band discontinuity, uh, LUMO LUMO and HOMO HOMO discontinuity at the interface. So because of this discontinuity, um, the um, gap here should be enough to split this, uh, overcome the exciton interaction energy and uh, split uh, exciton uh, to free electrons and holes. Um, so hole, free hole remains in donor and uh, energetically is favorable that um, electron uh, will be uh, kind of accepted by this acceptor material. So they are both um, organic semiconductor materials, but we need to we cannot mix randomly materials. Uh, we need to first check, like measure with uh, UPS uh, or some other IPDS also, um, like inverse photoelectron spectroscopy or ultraviolet photoelectron spectroscopy for HOMO and LUMO values. Um, we need to measure them experimentally and then uh, see if there is enough uh, discontinuity between LUMO, LUMO and HOMO, HOMO levels uh, in order to split efficiently excitons. If these guys will be too, these um, gaps will be too small, it will not be efficient to separate excitons and they will recombine. Uh, however, we cannot make too big gaps here because you see they will define the effective band gap of the blend. And as I mentioned before, this effective band gap of the blend will um, limit the maximum open circuit voltage. Uh, if we make big gaps here, the effective band gap will be small and means that we fundamentally will not be able to achieve higher uh, open circuit voltage. And since it is in the numerator of that equation which defines performance of solar cells, we will fundamentally uh, limit uh, 
high performance for our system. So we always want to find some uh, sweet spot um, by combining these two uh, materials in the donor uh, in the bulk heterojunction. Another thing which is important, which provides some limits for using different donors and acceptor pairs, uh, is the morphology of this bulk heterojunction. Why it's called bulk heterojunction? Because uh, we have interface between donor and acceptor everywhere in the bulk. So it's some self-organized uh, nano uh, structured um, uh, morphology of donor and acceptor. And how we make it, we don't control this. So it, it's self-organized. We make a solution. So we have a solvent, for instance, some um, chloroform and uh, put there some uh, donor and acceptor material dissolve and then spin coat it on our prepared substrate. So by itself, based on the surface energies of this donor and acceptor material phases, uh, they structure in uh, some favorable for this pair donor and acceptor, this combination way. And that could be either good for organic solar cell or not. So we can slightly um, do some, some manipulation of this process because we can anneal, we can solvent anneal, we can add some solvent additives which uh, dry slower than the main solvent and that provides additional time for molecules to rearrange uh, and form this um, self-organized structure. So it has um, some effect, but uh, eventually, um, it should be admitted that this is self-organized nanocomposite structure and some um, materials may, combinations of some donor acceptor materials, they can be good and you can achieve high performance in other combinations with the same material. But specific combination of uh, this and that donor acceptor material may not work because of several reasons. Uh, so first, these domains of donor and acceptor could be too large, for instance. If they are too large, there is some limited diffusion length of exciton. Um, it is from 10 to 20 nanometers, and uh, they need to reach the interface of donor and acceptor in order to split. If within this diffusion lens they don't reach the interface, they will just annihilate and this exciton will be lost. Um, that's why the uh, domain size of, size of donor and acceptor uh, networks uh, should not be uh, larger than 20 nanometers uh, in plus minus. However, if we have too good solubility of donor and acceptor and we make these domains much smaller, so it will be efficient for excitons to be splitted. But in that case, it will be a challenge to extract charge carriers because they need to move, um, electrons should move through the acceptor uh, network and poles should move through donor network. And if these networks are too small and these conductive channels are too narrow, um, they will be lost on the way to electrodes. So there should be some sweet point uh, at the middle. And uh, it's uh, a big field of uh, study uh, trying to um, optimize morphology of organic solar cells. And that's very important. So let us assume that our exciton made it to the interface and we uh, have a chance to uh, split in free electron hole uh, uh, charge carriers because of these energy uh, gaps at the interface. And the problem is that um, it's not uh, necessarily that we will get these free charge carriers. There is first mechanism of recombination, so-called geminate recombination. Uh, geminate means that we have a recombination of, X, uh, of electron and uh, hole, which originate from the same exciton. So instead of being split, um, they can still recombine uh, there is form such so-called charge transfer state with the um, energy of the effective band gap of this donor. And there is some dynamics which could 
uh, result in uh, recombination of exciton even at the interface. So that is called gemmed recombination, and these processes are quite fast. They happen in the time scale of like one, like few nanoseconds before, uh, uh, like after exciton generation. Uh, so they are, are really different from other type of recombination. So this is gemmed recombination of excitons at the interface. Uh, let's assume that we managed to uh, split this exciton and we already finally have uh, free electron in the acceptor material and free hole in the donor material. So there is one um, next step which we need to do. We need to extract these charge carriers. Uh, they move through these respective networks to cathode and anode. Uh, are collected and uh, uh, can contribute to external electric circuit, uh, like current in the external uh, circuit and uh, do some useful work, charge our uh, smartphones or something like that. Um, unfortunately, it's not, life is not so easy and there are other problems on the way. Uh, there is so-called non-geminate recombination losses when electrons and holes originated from different excitons meet each other on the way to cathode and anode at the interface and recombine. So this non-geminate recombination can be split in two mechanisms. First, by molecular recombination, when we have band-to-band -band recombination, and we cannot avoid this because if we can absorb light like photon and generate electron hole pair means that it should be possible to uh, have a reverse process and uh, um, get recombination of electron hole pair and uh, get some uh, photon as a result of uh, radiative recombination. So a bimolecular recombination uh, in most cases should be radiative. So it as a result, it should be uh, emitted some um, photon back. Uh, however, there, if you dig deeper into this, there are uh, possibilities of non-radiative bimolecular recombination holes. And there is another type of non-geminate recombination loss is trap-assisted. So trap-assisted recombination can be in the bulk of the active layer or at the interface active layer electrodes. Uh, so that happens where uh, some defects and impurities in the active layer, which form deep energy levels uh, in the band gap. And those serve as efficient recombination centers, which follow the shortly read hole uh, recombination statistics, where we are uh, defect levels in uh, semiconductors within the band gap. Uh, so uh, for that, case we can eliminate these losses by making high purity active layers and high quality interfaces with surface passivation. Uh, however, um, like surface recombination, we will talk about this a little bit later, will be uh, the one of the key limiting factor for really high performance devices. Nowadays, uh, high performing um, perovskite solar cells with performance higher than 20%. Uh, there are a bunch of um, research studies uh, which uh, make statement that the main limiting factor nowadays is surface recombination at the interface between active layer and um, electrodes. May I ask a couple of questions at this point? Sure. So uh, the very first question I was I wanted to ask was, uh, those pictures that, that we see are basically the way they are placed on the substrate, am I right? I mean, this is not a 3D view. That's basically 2D view. 2D view that uh, well, that light is shining from the from the top to towards the page. Uh, no light. So if we have anode and cathode here, and this is our active layer, so light is shining from this side, mm -hmm. uh, the left to the because we always shine light through the one of electrodes, either cathode or anode. Uh, depends on the device configuration. It could be normal or inverted. Okay. So another question I wanted mm -hmm. to ask was uh, either uh, whether the the donor or receptor those materials, the red and blue, are they electrically neutral? 
when what, before before under, before the what do you mean under electrically neutral i mean um so before this exciton appears you do mm -hmm. the uh, uh, from so, so solar energy i mean mm -hmm. are they are they uh, like negatively positively charged prior the the oh no 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 okay so uh all materials are neutral there are no negative or positive net negative or positive charge because if we create exciton then uh, there are two charges which compensate each other and even when we split them there's electron in hole but there are many electrons in holes and in the volume uh, of active layer of course it's electrically neutral otherwise there will be uh, impossible to uh, operate such devices so this all materials are oh, sorry I come back, are electrically neutral but uh, maybe um, your question could be better addressed if we highlight the fact that we do not have free charge carriers in this donor and acceptor material prior uh, excitation with sunlight. So these materials are not doped. So we don't need to dope them in order to create some majority charge carriers. Like in silicon, for example, we make PN junctions. So we have P-type silicon, we have N-type silicon. And in this case, we already have plenty of uh, holes and electrons which are mobile in these materials and can contribute to charge transfer. So in this case, donor and acceptor materials should not be doped. They are intrinsic semiconductors, means that um, Fermi level for this semiconductor before they are like put together is somewhere in the middle of the um, band gap. And uh, there are there's very minimum concentration of mobile charge carriers, holes and electrons. Um, those which are thermally activated at room temperature. Since the band gap, Usually we use a semiconductor with this band gap one, 1 1.5 electron volts. This is quite wide band gap. And at room temperature, this so-called intrinsic charge carrier concentration is very low. It's like orders of magnitude lower than in case of uh, uh, doped semiconductors. So in that case, uh, if from this point of view, we approach to uh, electrical activity of these semiconductors, we can say, yeah, they are not electrically active, they are not dope, they are intrinsic semiconductors, and we can kind of neglect in first approximation with charge carriers in these uh, semiconductors before we shine light on them. But once we shine light on them, we generate a lot of uh, excitons, they are split at the interface, and obviously we will get um, a lot of free electrons and holes in the active layer. Oh, thank you. And if I may, the last question. So you said that the, sure. those uh, uh, electrons and holes are, are free. Does it mean that uh, when an electron reaches a cathode, it is, it is able to easily move uh, towards the cathode? Yeah, sure. That's the that design in that way. You see that work function of position of Fermi level of cathode. In, is a bit lower than LUMO, so it's energetically favorable to, for electron to move from um, uh, acceptor material to uh, cathode. And the same we can say for uh, holes from donor material to anode. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You are welcome. Okay, so now let us consider some um, simulated uh, JV curves to understand um, what mean uh, recombination losses. So uh, we remember this equation for power conversion efficiency of solar cells. We have short circuit current, we open circuit voltage and field factor. So we want all of these parameters to be as big as possible. So here we have this black JV curve, let's call it some JV curve of an ideal solar cell. We don't have any, any recombination losses, and we get the highest values for VOC and field factor. So if we get some geminate recombination, so this first type of recombination when we lose excitons before they can split in for free charge carriers, that obviously will reduce the amount of free charge carriers which can be collected by the um, 
electrodes. So we will automatically reduce our short circuit current so it goes down. And also we will reduce VOC because uh, if we create smaller amount of free charge carriers per unit uh, time interval, um, that means that we will have net like equilibrium concentration of these charge carriers lower. And uh, uh, eventually there will be smaller split between quasi Fermi levels, which describe um, statistics of these non-equilibrium charge carriers in organic or any other semiconductor. So we will lose also open circuit board. Now let's consider that we add additional recombination, which is non-geminate recombination. For instance, Shockley read hole recombination, the strap assisted recombination. Uh, so in that case, we uh, definitely will also lose additional free charge carriers. It's after, so this non-geminate recombination happens after splitting excitons already. Uh, so it, in time scale, it happens. Uh, within microseconds. So if giant recombination happens within nanoseconds, um, uh, non giant recombination happens in the time frame of microseconds. So we additionally lose uh, all these uh, photoelectric parameters, including field factor. Uh, field factor also re is reduced because of um, trap assisted uh, or shockley read hole recombination. So we see eventually that. Um, with addition of each mechanism of recombination losses, we reduce photoelectric characteristics of our solar cells and eventually get lower PCE. So that's why it's so important to understand the physics behind this uh, recombination losses. Uh, and also we need to address generation processes. That's also very important in order to um, understand what's going on and how we can eliminate this unwanted uh, uh, recombination losses from our devices in order to achieve higher performance eventually. So how do we address generation uh, of excitons? Uh, first, we need to generate excitons, then they, there's geminate recombination losses, then uh, non geminate recombination losses. So first generation. Um, in order to um, understand how much, uh, how many excitons will be generated in our active layer, we do some uh, transfer matrix optical um, uh, modeling. And uh, that requires uh, to measure spectral distribution of refractive index and extinction coefficient of all layers which uh, form our organic solar cell. Uh, since the thickness of layers is very small. We need to take into account interference effects. Um, inside, as you may see here, is done this simulation of normalized um, intensity of electromagnetic uh, waves with different wavelengths. Uh, we are interested in the active layer here. And then we can calculate total absorption, total reflection, like absorption in the active layer, like parasitic absorption. And eventually, based on this analysis, we can get generation rate of excitons in the active layer as a function of position in the active layer. So from zero to total thickness of our active layer, and also as a function of wavelength. So um, we have on this spectrum IM 1.5, which is solar uh, standardized solar spectrum. And uh, uh, we can then integrate all over the wavelengths, then integrate all over the thickness and get the total um, ideal photo current, which we would get if we don't have any recombination losses. Uh, however, we do have recombination losses and they should be addressed. So first it's uh, so-called geminate recombination, this fast, recombination process. One of the ways how we can address them, we can use uh, laser pulses, like very uh, short laser pulses uh, with uh, um, some uh, time delay. So we generate charge carriers with this laser pulse uh, at some bias. Uh, it can be different, negative or like reverse forward bias. Uh, we can change this bias and see how 
Jemini's recombination depends on internal electric field because it may depend for some systems, may not depend. And then uh, we wait very short uh, interval of time, uh, let's say one nanosecond uh, or few nanoseconds, and then apply, oops, sorry, apply very large reverse bias in order to extract all charge carriers, uh, all free charge carriers. Uh, so we kind of, with this strong reverse bias, eliminate possibility for non-geminate recombination. But geminate recombination happens with this, this interval. So if we compare uh, how much we generate excitons, because we know uh, number of photons in this pulse, laser pulse, and then we can calculate number of um, extracted uh, electrons and holes at reverse bias, we can take the ratio and that will give us the uh, so-called pre-geminate uh, recombination prefactor. And uh, that will tell us, is this system good or not? Because uh, let's say if we have 0.95, means that 95% of all excitons can be split at the interface and contribute to the current in external circuit. Um, however, if it's like 0.5, means half of all excitons will be uh, still recombined at the uh, interface, so it will be lost. And uh, uh, of course, such system is not very good for uh, uh, making efficient solar cells. So this is one of the approaches to quantify geminate recombination. Can I ask? So, yeah, sure. Uh, you said that uh, here you use the number of photons. How do you know then the precise number of photons? Or you uh, just take like rough number? No, no, you know the precise number because um, it's laser, it's uh, wavelength is fixed and it's monochromatic light. And we know the intensity of this laser pulse, and we know the duration. So we know the total power of this laser. Uh, we divide it by H nu, and we get the uh, number of photons in this uh, laser pulse. So we can get this number quite accurately. And we can get also quite accurately uh, that, so there is some photocurrent, uh, which when we change this uh, bias, we uh, start to collect this photogenerated charge carriers. This is time-dependent photocurrent. And when we integrate this time-dependent photocurrent, we get the total uh, charge uh, which was collected. Uh, so we can uh, quite accurately determine both values and then get the ratio between them. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So uh, there is also non geminate recombination, as you remember, unfortunately, we lose uh, charge carriers also after separation of uh, excitons, free charge carriers also can be lost. And one of the um, very simple and straightforward technique uh, to estimate the dominant non geminate recombination, uh, which uh, may consist of bimolecular trap assisted in the bulk and in the surface. Uh, is a light intensity dependence of open circuit voltage. So it was shown that for pure bimolecular recombination, uh, when we have open circuit voltage versus generation rate or light intensity, because uh, these guys are proportional to each other. So it's not so important which uh, parameter we take. Uh, for pure bimolecular recombination, the slope of VOC dependence on this generation rate or light intensity should be uh, equal to one KT over Q. Uh, however, if for instance, we have um, trap assisted recombination in the bulk, it was shown that this slope will uh, increase and for very uh, high concentration of defects and some impurities in active layer uh, in the bulk, we will get slope which is equal to uh, 2 kT over Q. So it means if we measure this, it's quite simple measurement. We measure GV curves at different light intensities. We use some neutral filters. So we don't change the spectral distribution of our light source, which is put neutral filter, which uh, 
re reduces um, equally intensities of all wavelengths. Um, we measure JV curves, get this VOC plot versus light intensity, and see, okay, if it's one, then we can assume uh, in first approximation that it's only by molecular recombination. However, if it's like 2.6, then we see that there is something else besides by molecular recombination is going on, in particular, a trap assisted recombination in the bulk. And uh, um, that obviously should be taken into account in our further uh, analysis. However, um, um, recently we found a bunch of uh, systems uh, with uh, uh, slopes smaller than unity and check literature there were previously um, reports of this VOC versus light intensity dependence with slopes less than unity, uh, which uh, doesn't fit into this uh, model which we described previously when we have unity or more than unity. So here we have less than unity. So it took us some time to develop a uh, full analytical uh, model for multi-mechanism recombination dynamics in organic solar cells, which takes into account um, recomb biomolecular recombination, uh, trap-assisted recombination in the bulk, and trap-assisted recombination at the surface between active layer and interface. And uh, uh, by combining all this, we can uh, show that this um, if we measure VOC open circuit voltage versus light intensity uh, with a slope uh, less than KT, like one KT over Q, that means that we have some dominant uh, surface recombination at the interface between active layer and electron. Uh, when we have such a model, we can analyze uh, recombination uh, contribution of each mechanism separately. And for instance, um, if we uh, check uh, recombination current originated from surface recombination at the interface, uh, this guy becomes important only at uh, voltages at forward biases close to open circuit voltage. So we see here that surface recombination will have a dramatic impact on open circuit voltage. However, at a short circuit current, when we have zero voltage, uh, it's negligibly small. So it exponentially decreases with uh, forward bias. And uh, uh, that's why when we, for instance, analyze short circuit current, we can neglect with the uh, parasitic effect of surface trap-assisted recombination. So that helps a lot to understand better which a photoelectric parameter is sensitive to which parameters, uh, like uh, which, which recombination factors. And uh, uh, it, is, uh, it allows us to consider more advanced uh, equivalent electric circuit where we don't have only shunt resistance, but we have um, an option to uh, analyze uh, separately recombination losses from different mechanisms and for uh, understand total recombination losses and performance of solar cells on a more advanced uh, level in order to um, develop some recommendations in terms of material science uh, or device engineering for preventing this unwanted um, photoelectronic process in the future. So with this, I would like to switch to this second um, topic we want to uh, discuss uh, in our discussion here. Uh, is organic near-infrared uh, photodiodes. Uh, it is necessary to highlight that organic, not only organic, but photodiodes are used in a wide range of uh, applications. So it's some uh, robotic systems like medical uh, control systems, uh, also CCD cameras, it's widely uh, used. Uh, microchip um, photodetector technology, uh, also spectrometers uh, when we need to uh, use some combination of a, a photodetector with monochromator, which can split light in um, and analyze spectral composition of this uh, light source. Uh, so there are different um, applications, 
and taking into account these advantages of uh, organic semiconductors, this flexibility of organic semiconductors, uh, we um, can make um, biocompatible and uh, conformable um, uh, photo uh, detectors based on organic semiconductors, which can uh, be uh, easily uh, introduced for uh, medical monitoring and uh, without damaging human tissues um, and providing some additional uh, comfort level. So one of those, uh, there is Mitsubishi Chemicals Company, which uh, collaborated with um, the Center for Polymers and Organic uh, Solids. And there was a project I was partially involved in, um, in developing some near IR uh, organic photodiodes uh, based on uh, novel organic semiconductors. Uh, so there are three types of photo detectors. It's some photo resistor when we have just highly resistive semiconductor material between two electrical contacts. We shine, apply some voltage to this context, shine light. We create uh, free electron charge carriers. They start to generate uh, this uh, semiconductor starts to uh, conduct electricity, so we can measure the signal and detect light. Uh, another is photodiode device structure, which we are working on, and we will discuss this here. Uh, when so it, it consists of the same device uh, layers, like device architecture, as uh, solar cell. It just a bit different approaches in uh, which are focusing on other features. For instance, one of the key requirements is very low um, dark current. So we want to have as small dark current as possible because that will define the noise level and we want to keep it low. Uh, and also there is an option to make some phototransistor. So it's similar to photoresistor, but besides um, some uh, light modulation of the conductivity of the channel, there is an option with field uh, modulation of the conductivity of the channel, so we can uh, fine tune the properties of this photo detector uh, with uh, higher flexibility. So we focus here, like organic um, photo detectors, uh, we analyze uh, them in the scope of this photodiode architecture. So we pick up some um, non-fuller acceptor, narrow band gap non-fuller acceptor, which absorbs light at quite long wavelengths, up to 1200, which is quite unique feature because uh, most organic semiconductors are wider band gaps. So they are shifted towards their absorption uh, spectra shifted towards shorter wavelengths region. Uh, so this particular, there was a task from Mitsubishi Chemicals to make um, near IR photodiode sensitive at 960 nanometers. So that's why we had to um, use some uh, narrow band gap non foreign acceptor. And uh, we made different types of devices. It was like with 90 nanometers and 300 nanometers thickness of active layer. Uh, we see that uh, reverse dark current, which is not good in uh, devices uh, made for uh, photodiodes, uh, is lower for a thicker active layer, which provides some um, uh, options for, uh, so, so thicker active layers provides options to reduce this um, non-uniform uh, um, pinholes in this uh, non-uniformity in the field, some pinholes, and uh, uh, reduces current which flows through this active layer at uh, reverse bias. So um, when we measured also noise current, we see that uh, at uh, this spec within the spectral range of electrical noise, it is uh, significantly lower than uh, for the thin device. And if we compare the specific detectivity, which shows the ratio of useful signal uh, to the uh, noise signal, we see that thick um, device exhibit it quite higher um, specific detectivity comparable to a silicon photodetector. Uh, so if we uh, think about it, it's quite 
uh, an achievement for a 300 nanometers um, plastic layer to compete with uh, established uh, silicon technology. Uh, however, there are other parameters, uh, for instance, fast response. And uh, uh, we mm, managed to, uh, if we measure this fast response of uh, um, the sick active layer photodetector, so it, for instance, at 20 kilohertz, it can repeat quite nicely the signal. Um, however, at 200 kilohertz, there's already some change in the shape because uh, it has some limit in following this high frequency signal. However, uh, these uh, response, time response characteristics are enough to implement this uh, technology uh, in uh, uh, monitor this uh, organic photodiodes in monitoring uh, human pulse. Uh, you can see that uh, before and after exercises, so there is some increase in the pulse uh, measurement per uh, unit time, and uh, uh, this res time response of uh, 300 nanometer thick um, active layer photodiodes uh, based on organic semiconductors is enough to uh, realize this uh, monitoring purpose. So uh, I would like to summarize my talk with uh, the statement that during last uh, years, I was uh, working on a bunch of different projects which are uh, involve a quite broad spectrum of electromagnetic waves, starting from some uh, cadmium telluride graphene uh, gamma and X-rays detectors, like uh, photodiodes and solar cells, uh, thermoelectric uh, devices, uh, and which work in the infrared region and microwave radio waves region. Uh, These ionic organic electronic ratchets are devices which can convert them into DC power and uh, power some small electronic devices. So such a broad range of, of successful projects could be realized in collaboration with uh, enthusiastic and uh, motivated people. So I would like to acknowledge uh, professors with whom I was working previously before uh, joining uh, Nazarbayev University, um, my colleagues from Center for Polymers and Organic Solids, our collaborators all over the world, and of course, also some funding um, agencies who supported this research and uh, provide me an opportunity to work on these exciting um, uh, projects. So thank you very much for uh, attention. Uh, if you have any questions, you're welcome. We can discuss this. And uh, um, again, thank you for attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, how, when will we be able to, uh, to, to see the, the recording? Oh, um, I will send you the link. So I will copy this uh, file and uh, then I will send you the link. Okay, okay, thank you. So you will have access to this recording or maybe send it like attached to Google uh, Drive and send it uh, to you guys. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So uh, what's with our time? It's almost six, actually. Yeah, so we are in time. Uh, didn't push it too long. Uh, if you have any questions now, you're welcome. If you need to process some of this information, you can also ask me during our uh, second lecture where I will focus more on uh, things which are related to my future projects at Nazarbayev University. Uh, that will be on uh, Thursday at 4.30. I hope everything will work and I will be able to connect from uh, the hotel in Almaty. So I stop my... Okay, thank you. Goodbye. Yeah, thank you very much for attention. Have a good evening, guys.
Goodbye. Have a good trip. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.